Uh, my name is Jesse Roberts. I'm a cyber threat intelligence an uh, <coughs> analyst at Mandiant. Uh, before that, I was a offensive, uh, cyber officer in the Air Force. And then when I'm not doing my job, I also I enjoy building things with microcontrollers, 3D printing, uh, and I also like uh, open source intelligence investigations, uh, particularly regarding uh, information operations campaigns. So excited to be here with you all tonight. and. Uh, yeah, look forward to some questions. I'm Drew Myers, although for some reason my badge says I'm Johnny X. That was my secret hacker handle I abandoned a long time ago, whatever. Um, I'm the guy who I guess you blame for starting all this stuff back in the 90s. And I am currently uh, um, a broke-ass student again because I'm a for punishment. Yay. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Kurt Absol. Uh, I am an attorney who uh, I've spent uh, much of my career uh, working to provide free legal assistance to security researchers who have had legal issues with uh, uh, either doing the research or disclosing vulnerabilities in the face of a vendor who found that to be uncomfortable and sue them. Uh, so I am currently employed as the uh, Associate General Counsel for Cybersecurity and Civil Liberties Policy at the Filecoin Foundation. I am a special counsel with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, and on the board of the Security Researchers Legal Defense Fund. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have that involve legal issues. But it's not like about your own legal issues, <laughs> general questions. <laughs> I'm Todd Grady. I've uh, been in IT and security since before so I've been born. Um, I'm currently a threat analyst for a major healthcare insurance company. And that's about it. Hi, I'm Andrew Hirsch. I'm a professor of uh, programming languages and cybersecurity at the University of Buffalo, uh, where I study how uh, better programming languages can give us more secure programs. I am Isaac Jeff. Yes, we have too many panelists to fit at the table. <laughs> and I study, I, I'm an industrial scientist working on oh. distributed systems. Oh, and yeah. Thank you. Uh, I work for an open source Swiss company called UEX. Okay, so I guess we'll start with, um, we'll just go down the line. Uh, what is hacking to you? So hacking to me can have two meanings. The first one is the, the traditional sense. The, the term that I like the most is just using things in a way that they can be used, not necessarily a way they were meant to be used. So if there's a capability of a piece of technology and maybe the folks who made it try to lock it uh, behind a paywall or you know think that you and the user are too dumb to use it, so they dumb it down, you're not able to use it, just being able to bring that capability back out. Uh, and then the, the, the sense that probably more people are familiar with in the, in the modern sense is uh, criminal activity. So uh, basically exploiting systems that you don't have authorization to exploit. I agree with the first part of his definition there, exploring complex systems, not necessarily computer systems, and if you can do so in a humorous way, and particularly a non-destructive way, that's the best way to do it, and share what you learn. See, so yeah, for me, I think hacking is, I think, closer to that, that first definition, that is to say that it is about giving a, uh, getting a set of rules and finding ways around them, trying to be able to take ownership and control of the systems you use so that someone else is not the one who sets what the limitations are, but you can, with your, your skill and your ability, be able to find out what the limitations actually are and hopefully use that power for good. Yeah, so to me, hacking is, which is the, the very first definition. It's using something in a way it wasn't intended or making something that you've bought better than the manufacturer made it. Kind of person I can't buy a TV, a car, a computer, anything without dicking around with it. And I absolutely hate my wife absolutely hates the fact that I cannot leave anything alone. Um, so that's a lot of it to me is not even just using things in a way they're not intended, but making them better than the manufacturer had them in the beginning because everything is you know so locked down and there's ways around it. I mean, I think my fellow panelists uh, explored a lot of the space there. I think that's a, a very good definition. Another older definition I might bring in is just programming. 
a lot of old school programmers refer to themselves as hackers, and they don't mean they're breaking into systems at all. They just hack away at their computers, that, uh, their keyboards, makes the hack hack sound. That's what they're referring to. Uh, and a lot of computer scientists, like computer scientists, call themselves hackers, meaning that. I think that most of us. So is anyone not familiar with the terminology and the meaning of white hat hacker versus black hat hacker? Not familiar with it? Okay. Think of old black and white cowboy movies, the way you told the good guys from the bad guys, the good guys wore the white hats, the bad guys wore the black hats because it was I think white. it's appropriate to move away from that metaphor though. Like the white black hat is not a very good metaphor. It may be like good faith hackers or White and black hat. It is yeah. thrown around a lot, but this is why we move on as society moves forward. Yeah, generally ethical hackers a lot more accepted. I just think we shouldn't forget our history. <laughs> as we do remember it as we move on. I think most of us uh, use that first definition using a piece of technology in a way that was probably not originally intended. Uh, I can bring up a couple of real old definitions. There's the MIT definition, which is trespassing in interesting and exciting places on campus that you weren't supposed to go. Um, there's the destructive definition of hitting stuff until it makes a hack noise. Uh, there's, I mean, there's an old train hacking definition. Um, but for me personally, the, the first definition is usually what comes to mind. I guess there's one more, the commonly used media definition, which is typing really fast. Okay. Uh, one thing I will say, anything you may learn in Hacking 101 or 201, do not perform any of these against networks that are not your own unless you have permission from the network owner and have a get out of jail free card, which means something signed from them saying you can hack my shit. If you don't have that, don't do it, you will go to jail potentially. And we carry no liability whatsoever for any actions you may take that result in criminal charges being filed against you. Understood? Okay. Um, we got, we always at Hacking 101 take a collection for 201 for pizza. This year is going to be no different. Uh, they have done away with the booze as far as us being able to provide them, which is sad, but that does not keep you guys from being able to bring whatever you want. We just can't distribute it to you. So feel free for that. Uh, but if you want to uh, donate to the Hacking 201 Pizza Fund, that box should be on the floor down there. And, uh, after, the, after the panel, you can do it, or anybody can come up and just throw some money in it if you want to. Okay? All right. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started a little bit just talking about a few things. Uh, there's small little presentations that our uh, panelists have put together, and we'll do what we have time for. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with Drew. He seems very excited about his, or Johnny X. There you go. Be first. Okay. Yes. All right. uh, do we have the file ready to go? I tried to, I tried to keep it simple and make it a PDF so it'll play on anything. Is it ready to go? You know what I'm talking about? You have no idea what I'm talking about. So, okay, the file I emailed everyone is not here. Maybe we should save that for 201 because, you know, there's like graphs and URLs and I was hoping people could take pictures and it will be online. Uh, short version is that um, I'm a computer science and astrophysics major. Uh, after almost 30 years in the IT industry, I decided to get a degree in it, and I'm combining my interest um, uh, in computer science and astrophysics to uh, use Raspberry Pis and modified uh, security cameras to build all-sky monitoring camera networks for meteor and meteorite detection and triangulation. And there are a couple of groups that do this based on based on NASA recommendations, which use very expensive, hard to find cameras, and a setup will cost you roughly seven hundred dollars per camera in your network. Um, the software for it is closed source and runs either on Windows or DOS. Who uh, hiss? Stuff I'm working on, and this is not entirely original research. As I said, Raspberry Pi fours. Uh, if you've got a 3D printer, you can print a lot of the housing stuff yourself for the cameras. You just get the CCD cores. Uh, better, cheaper, faster than the NASA stuff so far. And you should, for your first camera and um, uh, i4 system, be able to do it for under 100 bucks, and it drops with additional cameras added on the network. So 
and the software for it is free and open source. So I'll go into detail on that and hack into it. I want to make sure that the people who are running the PA system, no offense to you, you didn't get it, um, have got the actual file so I can go through it point by point and there'll be a text version available um, as well as the original PDF version on the EFF track website with all the URLs and research and there's even some white papers showing that the newer camera, the newer cheaper cameras are better than the ones that NASA recommends. So, that's me. Does everybody know what a Raspberry Pi is? Okay. Does any, put your hand up if you don't know what one is. Let's see. Okay. Uh, think of a computer that's credit card sized and it's very tiny. Very modular, very customizable and it it's about as powerful. Cheap. Yeah, very cheap. That's one of the yes. key factors, and it's about as powerful as a, a, a high-end personal computer 20 years ago was, which will still let you do a lot of stuff, and it runs a stripped-down version of Linux. So, lots of fun. If you're interested in getting one and to live near a micro center, that would be my recommendation for getting one because they're pretty good at chasing the scalpers away. They'll probably take your ID and only let you buy one a month if they have them in stock, but that's why they have them in stock and other people don't. Yeah, I have, I have something I want to talk about. Um, so, I was hoping I could talk a little bit about passwords and how passwords are actually stored on websites and in computers uh, to make them harder to hack. Um, so, I mean, everybody here I assume has heard about data breaches where people are able to steal databases from websites, get all of that information, and the last thing you want is for your password especially if it's reused, don't reuse passwords um, to be available for the whoever gets that database to look at. So what do you do? Well, <laughs> something wrong? Yeah, some gesture. Oh, um, so we're hacking down here. I see. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just try to ignore that then. So what do you do? Well. Who here has heard of P versus NP? A fair number of people, not everybody. So in computer science, we're worried about problems that are hard and easy. And easy problems are called P for polynomial. That's a, a technical, you don't have to worry about what it is. Hard problems are NP, non-polynomial. Uh, very creative naming. Um, but if you can find a function, so a way of turning numbers into numbers, or strings into numbers, uh, so your password into numbers, such that it is easy to calculate, it's in P, but trying to go backwards, trying to figure out what password was given for this number is hard, you can use that to store passwords. So this is called a hash function. Um, and a hash function is deliberately difficult to undo. This is sometimes, uh, more generally, a one-way function. Um, but this isn't good enough, because let's imagine you do reuse a password, which you shouldn't do. Don't reuse passwords. Um, then I can just look and see what the hash is, and I now have more information about your password. I can know whether you're reusing your password or not. So we're going to do something kind of clever. We're going to come up with an additional random few characters to add on to the end of your password. This is called a salt. I hear some people murder, murmuring it. Yes, you're absolutely right. It's called a salt. We salt the password by just adding that on to the end of your password, and then we run this hash function. Now, if I manage to get two databases, and you've reused your passwords, I have no way of telling. Uh, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, just keep going and we'll, we'll pull over to him once you're done. Yeah, I'm done. Oh, you are. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Can you all hear me over this part? Okay. So we'll get into this a little bit more in the 201 panel, but I wanted to show you a little bit of. Oh. We can share. I think I should put that one away or we're going to get a feedback loop going.
Okay, so I wanted to show you all a little bit of what I do on a daily basis um, when I encounter a piece of malware that I want to learn more about. So um, my job uh, is, is usually to find uh, new pieces of malware uh, related to the threat actors that I track uh, and to try to figure out what the malware does, uh, kind of what its next step is. So uh, this, this program that I have here is uh, VMware Player. So this uh, is based, you can basically think of it like a computer within a computer. Uh, so I can safely run malware in this uh, and then once I'm done with that, just reset it to the way that it was without any ill effects to my actual computer, which is good because this is my work computer. So if I run malware on it, I'll get in trouble. <laughs> or at least get, a, get an email saying, did you mean to do that? Um, so in this case, uh, this is malware that I found uh, just hunting on open source databases uh, such as VirusTotal. So I've downloaded it from uh, VirusTotal and put it on uh, this machine here. A quick show of hands, who's heard of VirusTotal, I guess? Most people, but okay. So VirusTotal is a big uh, database of files and anybody can submit a file to it for free and then it will run against 70 different antivirus engines and the antivirus engines will each tell you independently whether they think it's malicious or not and you'll get a score. So um, if your file is malware but it's pretty sneaky, you get, might, might get something like 13 out of 70 detections and if it's, uh, you know, if it's not sneaky at all and everybody knows how to detect it, you'll get a pretty high number. Uh, I have seen some things that are malicious that come back with zero detections um, and that just shows you that they did a really good job hiding the malicious behavior. Uh, but it also can be used to tell you wh whether a file is good or bad. Um, it can also be used for uh, finding interesting files that people upload. You would not believe the kind of stuff people <laughs> upload to VirusTotal. Because again, anybody can upload anything. It's a free, 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 free account. When you upload, it's publicly available. Only if you have a paid account is it not available. So you can find all kinds of interesting files that have been uploaded to VirusTotal for. And yeah. somehow people don't realize that. Mm -hmm. so, so they will upload like really personal information and then it's publicly available uh, even though it, it pretty clearly says like your file is going to be public now. And it's hard to get taken off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> believe me, I've tried. For Hacking 201, please uh, think about your favorites and tell us what you've seen. That would be hilarious. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, actually it'd be neat next year to get a, if we can get permission to do like a virus total dorking kind of search because there, there are a lot of specific queries you can put in to dig that stuff up. But anyways, all that to say, that's how this malware got on this computer, right? I, I downloaded it from the database, which if you have a premium account, there's just a big download button. I guess they assume if you have a premium account, you know what you're doing and you're not going to run it on your work computer, but that's what I've done here. So, <laughs> in, in this case, uh, VirusTotal actually has two download options. You can download it as a file where the raw file will just come down. I don't prefer that. Uh, you also can download it as a zip file and specify a password. So in this case, I have this uh, zip file, which the, the name looks like a big jumble of characters because a uh, gentleman on the end who was talking about hashes, that, that is the hash of the file. So the, the entire contents of the file were put into a hashing algorithm. They put out that string. And that's how uh, analysts like myself uh, use that to uniquely track a file. Because if even one bit changes in the file, it completely changes the hash. And now I know which file I'm talking about because uh, files often reuse names. You know, if I say, hey, I was analyzing network.exe and my coworker thinks I'm talking about something totally separate, uh, we're going to get confused. So. Um, I downloaded that as a zipped encrypted file, so then if I accidentally double click it while I'm moving it over to my VM, it doesn't run. Um, so I've done that here and uh, extracted it in this case. So uh, a lot of times what I do the first time is just uh, run an MD5 hash on it, uh, which again will run one of the hashing algorithms he was talking about, and I get this unique identifier. That, and then I'll check my notes to be sure I actually downloaded the right file, because it does happen, I download the wrong thing and I get into it, I'm like this does not look like what I was supposed to be looking at. Um, in this case, this is a PowerShell script, so we'll just open it in uh, in Sublime Text, which is one of my favorite hex editors. Uh, and that looks pretty unreadable, so we're gonna start by scrolling to the top. Um, I'm gonna see if I can blow that up a bit, because I'm sure that people in the back people see that. 
All right, anyone who's familiar with PowerShell, uh, raise your hand and give me a guess at what this is doing. I saw a redshirt first. So this is this is actually difficult because the bad guys know that people like me will be looking at it, and they went out of their way to make it unreadable. Um, if if you those of you who are, who are familiar with programming will know this is not what a sane program is supposed to look like. This is probably nowhere in anybody's pro, uh, PowerShell style manuals, right? Uh, what what they've done here is. They they are they are adding uh, they've added little quotation marks uh, everywhere which uh, PowerShell will not interpret but uh, to the human eye makes it confusing they've changed the case uh, and then they're using this uh, set of numbers to basically scramble the the strings that would be recognizable and readable to a human um, anyone want to take a guess at, at what it's doing it's installing something and running. It, he Python says it's packages. installing something and running it. Python like, packages. Yeah, Python packages. So, so he sees the word pip here. Uh, in, in this case, the, this is the obfuscation working. Uh, this is spelling out the word pipe because it's supposed to add the e to to the pip. So that's a great example of like how this and, and what they what the, what the bad guys want us to do actually is what we're doing right now, which is just like taking time to figure this out because on their end, all they do is they write a normal, perfectly readable script and then they feed it into a program that scrambles it up like this. This literally takes them five seconds to make this unreadable and here we are spending time trying to figure it out. So uh, it, I usually try to, to not do this sort of thing if possible, if I can run it in a sandbox and just get it to run and, and tell me what it's doing. Um, I call this the malware paradox. Malware can be obfuscated but it must run. So at the end of the day like this does have to be readable enough to a computer to work. Um, so what, it, what it's doing here uh, is, is basically taking these, these huge chunks of hex data uh, and using PowerShell's uh, invoke functionality on them. So it's, it's basically just running whatever this is, which I don't expect anybody to be able to read that because I can't either, I'm not a computer. But what does stand out to me about this is this 4D5A right at the beginning. This is uh, in hex. If you if you pull up you know hex to string converter or something on your phone, you'll see that that uh, changes to be the letters M Z. Uh, if you're familiar with executable files, that is uh, the beginning of every executable file starts with an M Z. So when when I see that 4D 5A, I'm like, yes, I found something that is runnable. So uh, this this PowerShell script uh, has this this huge chunk of hex. You can see in the, the preview on the right, just a giant block. Uh, and it goes for a long ways. Uh, but what we can do with this uh, is get, get that to be readable and we can get the next stage. Uh, this is actually a multi-stage piece of malware, but I'll just, I'll end with this uh, portion just for the sake of time today. Uh, we can get into the final stages tomorrow. But what I'm gonna do is just copy this uh, and I'll keep talking because it's gonna take a minute to scroll. So um, um, when I'm teaching class, and I see something like this, I call it a Cylon detector. It's good for computers, bad for humans. If you can read it, you're a Cylon. Sadly, none of my students get my jokes, so. So if you see somebody in the audience who's like nodding their head as soon as that hex blob came up, and they already know what it does, we've spotted the Cylon. Right. This red eye thing is a giveaway, too. What if we try to put that into like, chat GPT and ask it to figure out what the human readable version is. So I've actually done that um, because, yeah, I use Bard because I do for work. Um, and you can, you can get it to interpret the scripts uh, sometimes. The, the trick with AIs is tricking them into interpreting your script and not just talking about some other script as if it was your script. It's, it, it, with AIs, that's, that's... Hallucination. Yeah, hallucination. AIs, kind of like people, are really good at being super confidently incorrect. <laughs> so it's important to basically fact check anything you get from... Uh, Elon Musk. How? How is this still... Okay, so... All right, we're getting to the end, finally. Um, if I wasn't zoomed in, this wouldn't take as long. Uh, but I do want you to be able to see. All right, so we have got to the end of this block. So I'll end my cursor there. All right, I grabbed a little extra because it, it slid. So we'll have to undo that. Uh, I'm going to open a program called CyberChef, which I highly recommend. Um, this was developed by... 
Uh, oops. Well, now I've done it. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Uh, so th this program called CyberChef is a really good tool for deobfuscating or or uh, decoding just about any sort of data. You put data in the input section, uh, you give it a recipe, because Cyber Chef is typically with this theme of like cooking things. Um, and your recipe consists of a variety of operations, and then those operations will be performed on your data when you hit bake, and you get your output over here. So in this case, I'll take my whole uh, blob that I had in there earlier, I'll hit Control V, sure. <coughs> All right. So now that we hit bake, uh, we'll get a result on the right side. And for, for people who have opened uh, compiled programs before in like a strings kind of view, uh, you'll, you'll recognize this kind of gobbledygook. That's pretty much what a compiled program will look like when a human tries to read it. There's your MZ header at the top, you saw those letters 4D5A, so that's translated for us, and then it usually says this program cannot be run in DOS mode. So this is my hint, this is a Windows executable. Um, but in order to, to save this piece of malware, I can hit save output to file. Uh, we'll say presentation malware.exe. This type of file can harm your computer. Yeah, that's why we're here. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna keep it. Uh, and then this is this is our next stage. Um, once this finally comes up, there we go. Okay. So so this is what we got out of there. Um, what we can do is run strings on it and kind of see uh, what's inside. Maybe it'll give us any hints. Um, we could scroll through all these, but I'm going to cheat a little bit because I know the string that's going to be usable. Uh, there we go. Oh, I mean, yeah. Um, control plus. Let's try it. It's not going to let me blow this up. All right, you'll you'll have to take my word for it in the back. I'm sorry. Um, so it, inside here, which we, we will dig into more tomorrow, um, how I know what this is because I cheated and I looked at this malware before the presentation. Uh, but this is a sample of async rat, which which is a, a backdoor. Uh, and basically, it, I, I can tell that first by some phrases inside the rat itself, uh, but then I'll also show you uh, tomorrow how we can actually decompile this rat back to the source code, which you can't always do. Uh, but in this case, this is a .NET executable, and there's a neat little tool that I can show uh, that, so we can actually see what the malware author was seeing when they put this together. So, um, sorry, I'm just going to slow you down for a minute. Does it, uh, anybody not know what he means when he talks about a compiled program? A few people. Uh, do, do you know what he means by discompile or decompile? Anybody not know? Okay, so some, some more people. So let me, let me just back up and, and talk about this. So programs are usually have three stages. The source code, which is what a uh, programmer writes. And it's a human readable language. Well, usually, as long as you don't obfuscate it, as we saw here. Uh, then there's assembly, which is basically writing in computer language, but in a human readable way. So that code that you just saw, where he was searching for it, and, well, you in the back didn't get to see it, I'm afraid, because we couldn't get it uh, enlarged. That's assembly. So what he did is he took the code, and then there's the binary. This is what you actually run on the computer. The process of going from source code to binary is called compiling the code. And so the compiled code is that binary that you can actually run. So what he did is he took the source code, said, I can't understand this, but I know the compiler can. The thing that actually compiles it can understand it. So I'm going to have a compile it. Then I'm going to have another program take that compiled code and pull up the assembly so that I can actually read it. And that's what you, you were doing there. Is that accurate? Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Um, and, and then what's neat about .NET, and actually somebody is really familiar with .NET in the audience, if you could tell me why this is, that would be super cool, because I just know that it works. Uh, but if you have a compiled .NET binary, you can decompile it to see the source code. It, with, uh, the, yeah, with, with any other compiled program, the best you can get is back to the assembly language, and you do, I, I personally do not enjoy trying to read assembly language. So if you're really masochistic, you probably do, but. You can actually do that with Java too. Yeah. With Java, yeah. yeah. 
So uh, it's I, I, I it's, it's back compiled. Yeah, it's, I can tell you what's it's, it's not going directly to the machine language, it's going to the interpreted language. Right. So oh, what's okay. going on is it's what's called by compiled, that's absolutely correct. Um, there's actually a assembly language and a CPU that runs that assembly language that's completely virtual. And that assembly language is way closer to C sharp or Java, in the case of Java, than assembly language actually is, which is why you can uh, decompile a lot more easily there. That's super cool. Okay, so I'm learning things today too. I, I appreciate that. So uh, tomorrow we'll, we'll walk through that and I can, um, my, my goal is ultimately with, with a piece of malware like this, when, when I find that first PowerShell script, you know, say it's found in a customer environment, they ask me, what does this do? You know, maybe, maybe their antivirus blocked it, but they wanted to know who was after them, who was trying to hack them, uh, what would this have done had it run? So in this case, we were able to extract the next stage. Um, and tomorrow we'll do some more analysis on, on that second stage uh, and try to figure out uh, perhaps what server it, it was going to call back to had it, had it run successfully. Yeah, I'll kind of piggyback off this. There are, so we use a lot of professional products as well, commercial products that do uh, some of this manual, it, it places this manual analysis, we call them sandboxes. So essentially it's a box that will, you know, you submit a file or a URL, anything like that in the system. It spins up a virtual machine, so just a little virtual copy of Windows 10, uh, whatever, runs the application, opens the URL, records everything it does, every virtual keystroke, every command line, every network call, everything like that, and it spins out reports for us to be able to say, you know, this is malware, it's doing this, it's reaching out to these servers. Um, Doing it manually is, is more fun, uh, but using those sandboxes is definitely, in a, in a commercial environment, is the way we usually do it. We even have, like, incoming email, if it's got an attachment, we dump it to a sandbox and run it before we deliver it to that end user. And that, that, that's a very good thing to do because, uh, yeah, like I said earlier, the attackers want us to spend all this time with this. So, like Todd said, in an enterprise environment, like, you get just, there's so much, you can't possibly spend time on every binary you see, as interesting as it is to go down those rabbit holes. Uh, and, and I love sandboxes because as long as the malware will run in the sandbox, some of them check for it, but, but usually they're happy to run. You just get everything you want out of it. I don't have to give a shit how this exactly works. It, it just does what the sandbox says it does, and I can move on with my day and, and give, the, give the information to whoever was asking. Yeah, and then we look at the sandbox, or we look at the files, or things that come through the sandbox because, oh yeah, that's kind of sketchy, but I don't know exactly what it is. Then we dig into it and figure out what it is. We let all the, let the sandbox get the easy stuff. That's about all I got for Just ripping on the subject of available databases of viruses and virtual machines, there's some research on um, virtual machines as honeypots. The idea with the honeypot being that you set up a machine which you want attackers to attack, just so you can see what kind of attacks are out there. And obviously the advantage of doing it in a virtual machine as opposed to a regular one is that you can shut it down from the outside, you can restart it, you can clone it, you can make a million copies of them. And in fact, making a million copies of them turns out to be quite useful, especially if you can do clever things where most of the time they're, they're not uh, any different, so you don't have to actually take much work to run so many copies. The reason you do that is you can simulate an arbitrarily large network. You can pretend to be a huge corporation with a million computers in it and uh, see if someone tries to hack into your corporation and see what happens. Or put this in between uh, a real corporation and the internet so that someone trying to hit the real corporation hits the honeypot instead. There's quite a bit of research in just doing that, just building virtual machines in which to run malware in which to attract malware and then figure out what the malware did that was so bad afterwards. One thing that's also really fun with virtual machines, you can put them together for scam baiting and you can get scammers on and mercilessly fuck with them. <laughs> that was my hobby in high school. I love doing it. I have a, I have a VM that's just called Sacrificial Lamb. <laughs> well, see, on mine, I've got a bunch of files along with some notepad documents that illustrate, uh, let's see, John Whitmore, his wife, his three kids, their social security numbers, birthdays, stuff like that. So, yeah. Uh, and that has been captured by some of these scammers who have logged into the machine, and the information is absolutely useless to them. So, 
screw with them as long as they're on the phone with you and they're not upscanning somebody else. So, um, does anybody out there have any questions they would like to ask at this point? We need to do the microphone. Yep, we do. Does anybody not understand the concept of a virtual machine? Okay, so a virtual machine is really just a, so it's a piece of software is called the hypervisor that runs, I'm running Windows on my laptop. Run a hypervisor, something like VMware or uh, Proxmox, like Proxmox, something like that. This simulate, within that software, it simulates computer hardware so that then I can run another Windows box, I can run a Linux box, I can run anything that would run on that virtualized hardware in a protected space. And the cool thing about that is, is you can control how much access it has out to your machine, to other machines. Um, and one of the really good things is you can immediately shut it off, reset it back to where it was, um, and you're good to go. So I, assuming you took snapshots. Assuming you have taken <laughs> snapshots, yes. Would uh, would you guys like to at some point see a panel that's more of a workshop on how virtualization works, hypervisors, things of that nature? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm working together a proposal to maybe do one next year. So. And to see how many levels of virtualization <laughs> virtualization we can do before things break and get weird. And there's a whole there's a you know there's a lot of techniques for trying to break out from a yeah. virtual yeah. machine. So I got access to a virtual machine. And now I'm going to try to break out of that virtual machine and see if I can get access to the host machine. Are you got to try to break us out of the matrix. <laughs> what gets to be a real pain is nested virtualization. Depending on how deep you go, you can put Proxmox inside of ESXi. I mean, there's an attack. Oh, device. oh well, that's sorry, we, sorry, we, we, we get distracted. Go ahead. Yeah. No, that's fine. Squirrel. Uh, we, run, we run across malware samples that um, are VM aware and will change their behavior based on whether they think they're in a VM or not. So, could you like talk about a few of the steps you take to sort of fool the malware into believing it's on an actual system and not a VM? Yeah, that, that's a great question, actually. Um, tomorrow, when we dive more into the rat, I can actually show you the part of the rat that checks for whether it's in a VM or not. Because but it's kind of a cat and mouse game. Uh, whenever the malware is checking for whether it's a VM, in a VM, is looking for specific things, usually running processes, uh, the size of the disk. Uh, those are a couple that come to mind from this rat specifically. Um, Nick Driver. Yeah, yeah. yeah it'll look for uh, basically any artifact within the computer that has the word VMware or something similarly, uh, giveaway like that, it, it will look for. Uh, but what's neat about that is uh, those are all just parts of the program. Uh, so if you're debugging it, uh, where, where you have run the program, but you tell it to stop at a certain point, you can actually fool it uh, by, you know, maybe it runs a check to see if it's in a VM and it decides the answer is yes. Well, that answer yes is saved somewhere in memory. And you just set the yes to be a no, and now it keeps going. Uh, that, that is a manual process, so uh, not really scalable to an enterprise scale. You have to, like, be really interested in that particular piece of malware. Uh, some sandboxes are also smart enough uh, to basically intercept the, the most common calls that a piece of malware will make to detect if it's in a VM, and it'll just say, nope, just kidding, you're not in a VM, keep running. Uh, but it's in the sandbox. So some sandboxes are smart enough, and the malware gets smarter, it just keeps going. Go ahead. Um, so when you have, you mentioned like when you get devices, you want to mess with them, and uh, I know your wife, I believe you said. Um, as someone who doesn't, hasn't really had that much experience hacking, there is a lot of fear of somehow messing it up and then breaking it beyond repair, of my knowledge. How do you recommend making sure that doesn't happen? So that's, like I said, that's one of the beauties of using virtual machines. So your Windows laptop, your Windows desktop, Mac, whatever you're running, uh, you, once you spin up that virtual machine, the worst you can do, if you're working in that virtual machine, is blow up that virtual machine. And then, if you've like, got a snapshot of it, which is just like a quick backup, it will revert. You can revert it right back. You've blown it up. So what? You haven't. There's no damage to your hardware. Um, you know, as long as you're making sure that there are settings within a uh, hypervisor that will allow that virtual machine to access files on your workstation, as long as you're not sharing files or sharing, you know, network connectivity, you're not going to blow up that box all you want. That's the beauty of it. On a related note, 
it's a huge advantage of cheap things. Yeah. So raspberry Pis and friends that are cheap, packable hardware. Go to a thrift store. Constant friends. The hacking community. And you'll learn a lot by breaking things. Go ahead. Uh, this is more a question for the uh, programming language professor. Um, in recent years, a lot of programming languages, including Rust and Go, have come out to try to address 60% uh, of CVEs being memory related, uh, dangling pointers, use after freeze, etc. I'm sure the uh, gentleman that's been hacking since the 90s can talk to us some about that. Um, I'm a big Rust fan, and a lot of the pushback that I get when trying to bring people into these memory safe languages is, for one, if you're having trouble with memory issues, skill issue. Uh, <laughs> and two, um, why try to invent a new tool set instead of fixing what we already have? So I, I think these are really good questions. And I'm also a big Rust fan. And I, I know Kurt will have some stuff to say about this because he's been involved in some legal initiatives on this side too. But let me try to address the, the uh, question on the table first, uh, which is um, often you can't fix what we already have. We've tried to fix C. Uh, I, I have colleagues who come up and tell me re regularly, oh, C is so simple. It has simple semantics. Well, I've seen the C semantics. It's a book about that thing. Uh, we don't, and, and that's actually not all of it. We don't understand what's left. Uh, there's another book about this, that just about how C accesses memory. Um, so the nice thing about something like Rust is by starting from scratch, and bringing in principled ways of reasoning about memory from the beginning, we don't run into these issues that we've run into with C, or God forbid, C++. Yeah, so I'll just add on to that from a, a legal and policy point of view. Uh, so there's been a lot of uh, policy interest, government interest, in getting more people to be used memory-safe languages. One of the things that, that came out uh, recently was uh, the uh, White House uh, put out a request for information on uh, how to increase the use of uh, uh, memory safety, what priorities should be, and getting more memory safe language to be used in open source software projects. Uh, and this is this is uh, you know, a multifaceted challenge. Uh, open source projects are you know, a bunch of independent actors that can choose whatever language they want, they can do whatever they want. And so if it is a better thing, and I think it is a better thing, to use these memory safe languages, how do we get to that point? Um, and so we're discussing like, okay, the challenge of like taking an existing language and making it memory is very hard. Uh, another challenge is if something is written in C, moving it over to something like Rust or Go, that is also a challenge. So perhaps you know we could make uh, sort of like, you know, what are, what are good policy solutions for this? Well, maybe you could make a tool that made it easier to to do that transition to help people. And this is one of the questions that they are asking. Another one is to look at the development cycle, that is to say, to uh, educational uh, efforts to find people who are learning about computing in the first place and have them learn to use Rust or Go or some other memory safe language uh, from the get-go so that when they start programming, whether it's an open source or otherwise, that is the language that they are used to and are using and are, are comfortable with uh, and move, you know, retrain people who have learned C into using more memory safe languages. Um, so there's, there's a number of different initiatives on this. I think it is a, a very important person and a very, very important uh, program to try to get people to, to move to this. We will still have many security problems, but if we can raise the baseline and remove these sort of common memory safety things, which is, as we were saying, 60% I've heard stats up to 70% of CVEs uh, from vulnerabilities that are, are put into a you know, database of known vulnerabilities are memory safety. And if we could get rid of those, well, we still have a lot of work to do, but it would be a big step forward in the baseline. The other thing I would say is that for the vast majority of these applications, Rust is overkill. You should be rewriting it in something like a, a Java or a C Sharp, something that is a managed memory so that you don't have to learn about all of these special type things that I love but are very complicated. Let's go to the next question because we're, we're, we're oh. running out of time. I know we've talked a lot about computer hacking. What are some of your guys' favorite non-computer hacking? I know you had brought up things like vehicles and appliances and stuff like that. What else do you guys, can you hack, do you enjoy hacking, so on and so forth? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I am also a, a kind of a car guy. I mean, I can't buy a car without doing something to it. Um, 
whether it's you know modern cars, for example, are fairly limited uh, for warranty reasons. They'll detune a car to make sure that it's you know going to be reliable for a long period of time with some simple software and even commercial hardware that you pay somebody to write a file for you. You know you can change the engine timing, change you know the car I have right now. I bumped it up from a factory 13 pounds of turbo boost to 24. Um, you know, there, there's things you can do like that. I, lock picking, I consider hacking. Um, I consider, you know, anything like that that you're making a product do something it shouldn't do. Uh, I started, you know, when I was a little kid, I don't know if remembers the Stompers, little battery powered four wheel drive cars. I figured out at like 10 that there was a resistor you could clip and it would go twice as fast. <laughs> Similar stuff with um, uh, shortwave radio sets and scanners back in the 90s and nowadays um, all about software defined radio, which is really cool. You can drill out Nerf blasters. <laughs> Don't get me started on Nerf blasters up here all night. <laughs> Next question. Hi, um, I'm here with my son, he's 10, and I, I don't know much. I'm, I'm studying databases, information system management, so I don't know the basis is programming. What would you suggest for him to start learning now? He would like to, and we won't make it to 201. Um, he's about to fall asleep now, so he won't make it tomorrow. <laughs> what what should he start doing now? Now? So In all seriousness, uh, Code.org is pretty great. Code.org is a, a way to learn how to program visually. Uh, it's a lot of fun. They, they gamify it pretty hard. The other thing you can look at is, uh, is Scratch. It's a great language for learning how to code. Um, and there's a lot of educational resources out there for people about your age, so. And then Python for Kids, that book, not too bad, it's a book. I, recommend, I can recommend the DragonCon resource too. The Science Track also has a lot of contacts locally. Are you local? We're in Alabama, Auburn. Oh, uh, they still might be able to help out. Uh, basically, makerspaces, um, uh, coding for kids type groups and programs. So before you leave the convention, check in with the Science Track folks to you put out a list of stuff like that. Many university departments have workshops, too. Check that out, see if they have something. We're working on it. But we, um, he's on the Auburn University kids robotics team right now. Excellent. So, but we're working on getting them to branch out. They pulled robotics from all the county schools, all the schools in the county. So, Honestly, trying to see if you can you slip amateur high-powered rocketry in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look forward to seeing great things from you. Go ahead. Uh, I'm a software engineer, and I was just wondering, you know, it's, it's something that I do all the time. I, I look at all sorts of projects, and I, I keep, like, changing my focus. And I was just kind of, just a general question, if, like, you know, I make, like, I, I looked into making emulators, and I, I'm tinkering with, like, Nintendo Switch, you know, with the hardware, and, and just doing all sorts of things. And I'm just, I just don't really understand how other people in the field really get, like, focused into one thing. And like, when there's so much stuff to look at, I'm, I'm just kind of curious. Did you get the impression that we're all focused? <laughs> <laughs> well, is there any like methodology, strategy, like, I, like because I'm just all the time just like going everywhere, and I, it seems like I can never get anything done. What's, what's the sort of idea? It helps if you done? have to finish something to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I do it. After it's fun. Yeah, write it down. I mean, seriously, I mean, it's, it's what someone will pay you to do. Yeah, I mean, note-taking is a huge thing for me, too. I mean, I, I have to write things down um, and map it out, you know, map something out beforehand. If you've got a project, just, you know, write down your, your key things you want to achieve and stick to them. The other thing, oh, sorry. Um, but, I mean, as far as, you know, being in security is not concentrating on something, but being able to switch tracks rapidly and go, ooh, and follow a rabbit hole down. The but then come back and go yeah. a different direction. Absolutely. And work with a team. They'll keep you accountable. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I have a question about the, uh, we were talking about earlier about sort of reverse engineering the malware. Uh, do you guys have any real life examples where you need to reverse engineer in terms of the assembly language that's occurring? Or does that actually like, I don't know, more like a, a fantasy that we like to read about and learn about? Yeah, no, that definitely happens. So I, in my current role, I see so much malware, I don't have time to dig into each one. Uh, but my last role, when I was in the Air Force, I ran a malware analysis cell. That was all we did all day, uh, was find nation state malware, and people would give it to us and say, we found this somewhere, and we think, you know, XYZ, nation state bad guy made it, and we would open it up 
uh, tools we use for that most like uh, usually were either Ghidra or Ida. There's actually kind of a whole debate in the shop as to which was better. I'm kind of a Ghidra guy myself, but it's probably going to get me some food, so that's okay. Um, but it, it is, uh, when the malware is important enough, uh, there, there are people who will, who will dig into that. Uh, I found that wasn't really for me. I, I learned how to do it, but it takes a very specific type of dogged determination to just like stick with something like that step by step by step because a, a piece of malware will, will be very complex and a lot of stuff that it does. Uh, I, in grad school, I actually did an internship at a company called Grammatech. Uh, that is all they do, is this sort of malware analysis and, and other program analysis. I'm afraid I can't talk about anything that we did because it's related to the government, but uh, yeah, we absolutely do a lot. In the corporate world, I don't go any further than what does the malware look like? What's it doing? How can I detect it? How can I block it to alert on it? And then like, we leave it. All right, we have around 10 minutes left right now, so let's get, the yeah, let's get them done. Rapid fire. Go let's ahead. Let's do short answers and we'll, we'll expand on, uh, on the Manhattan tool. Mm -hmm. That works. Uh, this is for the car guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I've read about like various CAN bus hacks, like mm -hmm. proof of concepts, where they'll pivot from the entertainment system or the BCM over to the ECU and start the car. Have there actually been any of those in the wild? Um, I'm not super familiar with CAN bus on that side. I don't. I think there are some in the wild. And a lot of stuff you see on cars can be, on YouTube is a little bit, um, as far as like hacking with a hack RF1 or something like that, capturing codes, replaying codes. Um, it's a little bit harder on modern vehicles than it was Eight or nine years ago, uh, CAN bus is a specific protocol that yeah, there's I mean there's a lot you can do with it. And yeah, it's not not much security on it. No, no, there's almost no security on it. The if security can, is finding the plug. If I can <laughs> offer another source in YouTube videos, um, check out the DevCon and Black Hat videos yeah. too. A lot of them are you know, theoretical, but there's some good practical stuff there too. Thanks. Uh, this is kind of for Andrew, but it's also kind of an open question. Um, what's your favorite and least favorite programming language? I'm curious what features are in the way and what aren't. This is the most common question I get. <laughs> uh, so my uh, most favorite programming language is, the, is always the one I'm making, and the least favorite one is always the one I last made, um, is the real answer. Uh, but there's a lot of features that matter a lot. Uh, I could get into a lot of detail, but I think we're short on time, so That's find me afterwards. My favorite is whatever somebody else wrote on GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead. Something common that I've encountered with um, apps running on Android phones that have some kind of security implications is they don't want to run on a third-party Android build or a phone that has root or in anything but stock Google or Samsung or, or whatever that may be. In the real world, is that something that people exploit on a regular basis or is this just somebody you know, going from a, some blog top 10 list of ways to secure your Android app doesn't want to do that? So I don't know, I mean, just trying to think of where you're coming from the question. Um, in a corporate world, like we, you know, everything we run, if you have your own personal phone and you want to get your work email on it, we're going to do everything we're trying to detect that you haven't done anything to your phone to have root access to it or whatnot before the. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of more end user things, um, medical apps, financial apps, that kind of thing. Your yeah, bank doesn't I, want you to have root. I don't know the answer, so I'm, I'm not really. We can rephrase the question, but I'm not quite. Yeah. Okay. Your your bank doesn't want you to have root because somebody might. Hold the mic a little closer. Your your bank doesn't want you to have root on your phone because somebody might run some malware on your mm -hmm. phone, and it can do a lot more if it can get root. Right. Uh, does that really happen on on a regular basis, or because not many people actually run rooted phones? Yeah, sure. I mean, it does happen. It doesn't happen as much anymore. People aren't running as many rooted phones. There are also applications that can hide the fact that you've got a rooted phone. Yeah. Uh, but security by obscurity generally doesn't work. You really want something to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say that, I mean, there are, I see Android malware still being produced by nation state actors currently. So so it is something they make. Uh, how they convince people to install that, I think, is the hard part, because most people just go to the Play Store and download something. It's pretty tough to get through the code checks there to have a malicious app wind up in the store, although it does happen. Uh, there, there are, but, but usually people who are interested in rooting their phones are also 
loading apps from some guy's website, there's an APK on there. Uh, if you know, even if some guy's website is well intentioned, you know, somebody can hack the website, and there could be uh, a malicious edit to the file that way. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's a huge threat vector, but it definitely does happen. I can see why the banks are are concerned about it. I love some guys that website. <laughs> Go ahead. A question about uh, virtual machines and uh, their ability to detect if they're virtual or not. I remember at an EFF conference with Scott, I think at uh, Manuel Stafford, talking about uh, sensing fan RPM speeds, uh, the ambient temperature, if they weren't at default values, and if any of you have any comments about uh, tricking a virtual machine into thinking it's actually in real life. I have never seen a piece of malware that checks for that, and if I did, I would just be so impressed. That would be really <laughs> <laughs> that's I mean, why they asked it at the EFF. Yeah, that's super cool. That is cool. Too. There, are, there are people that work on this, but it's um, mostly for Amazon, actually. Um, Amazon these days makes most of their money. It's not by selling stuff to you. It's by running virtual machines. Um, the Amazon Web Services, AWS, is their number one money maker right now. And it's just spinning up virtual machines and giving them out to people for a fee. Uh, so they've done a lot of security work and a lot of systems work on, on virtual machines to get them running really well, really fast, and really securely. Okay. Did you want to um, say, uh, we, I did bring the voting, machine, the voting machine here. Did you want to say anything about uh, electronic yes. voting? Uh, so we have a voting machine that is the style that was used back in 2008. Is that correct, Scott? Like, yeah, that would, I'm pretty sure that's a DRE machine, which means that's that, that, that just collects the tally inside the machine, which mm -hmm. you don't really have a vote by vote record. So. Yeah. Um, but a long time, I think it's in 2011. Okay. But if you want to come up and take a look at it, you're welcome to do so. Okay. And I would actually like to ask is there somebody who could help me carry it back to the room? Because <laughs> it's pretty heavy. You got a volunteer. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you can. Probably wouldn't hurt. Uh, we don't have it. You can trust us. We're your friends. I wouldn't trust him. If you don't have a laptop, no harm, no foul. It's not going to hurt anything not having it. Okay, uh, anything final? Um, yeah, we can't we can't stay late, but we can end early. That's the problem. And just remind people about the uh, about the collection box and and uh, uh, hacking to a window. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so if you if you want yeah. pizza tomorrow, let's go ahead and uh, just throw some money in the pizza fund, and we will get pizza tomorrow night at Yeah, if you're worried about anonymously throwing money into a pizza box, we do the public count afterwards out of this room because we got to use it for something else. You're welcome to watch, film, whatever. We give a whole bunch of people total, and that way everyone knows how much money was put in there and nothing goes missing.